The Crawford Laureate, Professor Chisholm, President of the Crawford Foundation and the Academy, and members of the Crawford family, dear audience, I wish you all warmly welcome to the 2019 Crawford Prize Lecture in Biosciences. My name is Ove Eriksson, uh, and I'm chairman of the Crawford Prize Committee in the Biology class at the Academy. Uh, and before I say uh, a few words and introduce Professor Chisholm, I would like to say something about the prize. The Crawford Foundation was established in 1980. Uh, by the great Swedish industrialist Holger Crawford. The main aim of the foundation is to support scientific research and education, but it also supports many other activities, social, cultural and artistic. The Crawford Prize is based on a donation to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences from Anna Greta and Holger Crawford and from the Crawford Foundation. And the prize has been awarded since 1982, following a four-year cycle. Mathematics and astronomy, there are two separate prizes, but they are awarded the same year. Geosciences, biosciences with special emphasis on ecology, and polyarthritis. In addition to polyarthritis, which was uh, an illness Holger Crawford suffered from, the choice of subjects aims at complementing the Nobel Prizes. That is, the subjects in natural science, which, with the possible exception of astronomy, cannot be uh, considered uh, to uh, be awarded Nobel Prizes. The procedure for selecting the Crawford Prize laureate is the same as for the Nobel Prizes. That means that the Academy invites nominations internationally, and normally we receive over 100 nominations. And the candidates, the nominated candidates, are then carefully evaluated by a prize committee with the help of external experts. And based on these evaluations, the prize committee suggests one or sometimes up to three prize winners. The final decision is thereafter made by the Academy. The prize sum is currently 6 million Swedish crowns. I can mention a few previous Crawford laureates uh, in biosciences. For example, Edward O. Wilson, Robert May, Ernst Meyer, Carl Vos, Ilka Hanski. Last time, we awarded the prize in biosciences, that was 2015. The winners were Tomoko Ota and Richard Lewontin. So this year, the Crawford Prize is awarded to Sally Chisholm for the discovery and pioneering studies of the most abundant photosynthesizing organism on Earth, Prochlorococcus. Sally Chisholm is Institute Professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where she leads a research team focusing on this little organism, the cyanobacterium Prochlorococcus, which you will hear more about shortly. After the discovery in the 1980s, the discovery of Prochlorococcus, uh, which got its name somewhat later, Chisholm decided to devote her scientific career to this small creature. This was a bold decision, but it turned out to also be a brilliant decision. Chisholm's research achievements are truly remarkable, with a long list of highly influential scientific papers focusing on Prochlorococcus. These cover an impressive range of topics, from genomics, interactions with viruses, local adaptations to small-scale environmental variation, and this is really small-scale, as you will soon find out, 
population and algal community dynamics, ecosystems and global, global carbon cycles, and applied environmental issues. It's covering almost everything. And this is also the uh, ambition of Chisholm's research group, quoting the homepage, developing Prochlorococcus as a model system for cross-scale systems biology by studying it from the genome to the global scale. Professor Chisholm has received many prestigious awards, for example, the National Medal of Science, and I would like to mention that she has, together with her artist Molly Bang, written a number of science books for children, which also have received prizes. They are excellent. I think there is a distinctive beauty in Sally Chisholm's research. It is like mirroring the whole biosphere through the lens of the tiniest of organisms. So for me, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Chisholm to have the 2019 Crawford Prize Lecture in Biosciences entitled Tiny Cells, Global Impact, a Journey of Discovery with the Microbe from the Sea. So please, Professor Chisholm. Well, th thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, it's always a surprise to me that, that when people actually read my papers and read my work. <laughs> um, and I, I, I just want to today uh, briefly thank the Crawford family and the Academy for this in incredible thing, which I didn't realize went through the same process as the Nobel Prize, and now I'm even more nervous. Um, <laughs> But um, I'll save the long thank you for the, for the banquet on Wednesday. But, um, but today I want to talk to you, tell you a, a story of sort of how, I, how I've come to be here. Um, and I'll start with a brief outline so that you know where we're going here. Briefly talk about life on Earth. Um, and, and, and the fruits of basic research, which, which involve the discovery of Prochlorococcus and, and everything um, that it, it has taught us. I'm going to give you little snippets uh, of, of some of the themes I'll talk about in more detail at the, at the symposium tomorrow. But first, go back to uh, the 1700s and Joseph Priestley, who was a um, theologian, um, but a, a natural scientist too, and, um, and discovered oxygen. He also discovered, invented soda water, which I learned <laughs> looking him up <laughs> in Wikipedia. Uh, but this was much more important. Uh, so what he did was he took a, an animal and a plant and he put, isolated them and he showed that the animal died without the plant. Um, and when he put them together, uh, the plant and the animal thrived. And this was the, the discovery of oxygen, but also the the beginnings of understanding the relationship of the element cycles of oxygen and, and CO2. And so this is the, the slide I show in my introductory biology class um, and tell the students, if you learn nothing in this entire semester, please remember this slide. And they see it about <laughs> 20 times and half of them still don't remember it. So, <laughs> but it's the primacy of photosynthesis on Earth that all of life comes from almost all of life. There's some bacteria that can do some fancy things, but most of the life on the planet comes um, via photosynthesis and um, plants and, and phytoplankton, taking carbon dioxide and using solar energy and converting it to living biomass. And then all of the animals um, depend on, on that organic carbon and we eat it and we respire it, uh, which is analogous to actually burning um, even chemically, we, we, we burn this stuff in our bodies and we use that energy to be alive, to move around, and to do everything that we do. And what's really important are the microorganisms, which tomorrow we'll have this symposium describing how they rule the world, um, because they cycle all the essential elements for life um, and keep this whole system 
going. So scaling that up to a global scale, um, on land you have uh, 50 billion tons of carbon go through this process um, every year. That's a, a, the weight of 50 billion Volkswagen Beetles is the way I describe it, if you can't imagine that much gas coming into the system. Um, and at the same time, the phytoplankton, uh, which we call the invisible forest uh, in the, all of the oceans and lakes, do roughly the same amount of photosynthesis as all the, all the plants on land. It, that's rounding up a little bit to make them equal, but roughly the same amount. And they do that with a fraction of the biomass that the, exists in the plants on land. Um, this is the extraordinary thing. They're just lean little photosynthesis machines. And they do this through exponential growth. All they have to do is grow and divide and grow and divide. They don't have plants. I mean, they don't have stems and all kinds of other stuff to maintain like the higher plants. And this is a book from one of the children's books, I mean, a picture from one of the children's books trying to illustrate this exponential growth um, that if they keep dividing and dividing, they grow um, into dense biomass. And then this is the scientific version of that. Um, and of course, in the children's book, we say, well, if they grow so fast, you know, why aren't we knee deep in phytoplankton? And the obvious thing is because they're eaten. So on a global scale, everything that is uh, basically on average, almost everything that is photosynthesized is eaten and respired, and the same um, basically goes on in the sea. So this is an image that I try to show to, to, to show that the, the phytoplankton live in this tiny little 200 meter layer at the top of the ocean. And this photosynthetic layer feeds the entire deep sea. Um, and most of the carbon that's produced in the surface water just gets recycled in the surface water. But some of it settles to the deep sea. And this is what we call marine snow. And it comes from the animals that are eating the phytoplankton in the surface and they're pooping and excreting all kinds of organic carbon and then it comes together and makes this gelatinous stuff and bacteria colonize it and it sinks to the bottom of the sea. And while it's doing that, it gets re respired, so carbon dioxide gets re regenerated in the deep water where it's not being produced. And the result is that there's an increased concentration of CO2 in the, in the deep sea. And this is what we call the biological pump. So the phytoplankton are always there pumping this CO2 to the deep sea. If they were dead, and if the oceans suddenly mixed, if the oceans were dead, um, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere would be two to three times what it is now. It would be a very different planet. So um, this is a feature of phytoplankton that's often uh, unappreciated. We all know that they're the base of the food web, but they're also playing their role in maintaining the global carbon cycle. Okay, so now on to the early career and the discovery of Prochlorococcus. So I want to show, this is me <laughs> in 1978, joining the civil en engineering department at MIT. Um, you can find me, perhaps, but I'm right there saying, what on earth am I doing here? And, um, and that's basically the way I felt back then because uh, I have no engineering background. And, um, but MIT biology is, is, is all molecular biology. So environmental um, biologists are scattered in many different departments. It's now called the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. But uh, th uh, there I was, and, um, so I, and I was studying phytoplankton. Um, these are the larger phytoplankton that roughly the size, the width of a human hair, uh, that some of them you can almost see, you know, with the naked eye, um, but they're easy to see under a microscope. And we were studying these, I was interested in what made them grow, what regulated their growth, um, and how they synchronized to the light-dark cycle. They, their cell division would, would um, synchronize as you pulse the light-dark cycle, and we wanted to study that by studying their nucleus. Um, and so we were staining their, their DNA, and we wanted to use an instrument called a flow cytometer that cell biologists use regularly uh, 
to measure the DNA in individual cells. Those instruments cost a lot of money, so I had this talented young um, postdoc, Rob Olson, in the lab, um, who found a book that said how to build a flow cytometer. So <laughs> he and uh, Sheila Frankel in my lab, talented um, woman and the techni technician, uh, built this flow cytometer based on a, a microscope, and we used that to study these organisms. But, and here's how the flow cytometer works. Um, you inject the sample in this capillary tube, it's, it's extremely small, um, and the cells go single file, and uh, you focus a laser beam, on, and the cells scatter light according to their size, and they emit light, they fluoresce light, depending on what stain that you use to stain them. Um, so you can study properties of individual cells. And as we were using this sort of homemade instrument, um, we, we realized, we recognized that, that because phytoplankton are photosynthetic, they have pigments that, that fluoresce red. Their green pigments fluoresce red, so just like these stains you would use um, to study the, the nucleus, they fluoresce a particular color. And so we said, wondered, well, what would happen if we, you know, took one of these on a ship and just put seawater through, because there's all these phytoplankton that are fluorescing red, what would we see? Long story short, um, we, I managed to get funding to buy what we called the big rig, like a real flow cytometer, with a money back guarantee um, that if it didn't work on a ship, uh, they would take it back. Uh, and um, that was a huge challenge. So this is a typical cruise in the North Atlantic. And here's where I have to credit uh, Rob Olson, um, who had the courage to put this thing on a ship um, and think it would work, because you've got this tiny little laser focused on trying to focus on this thing, on this rolling ship. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, he said, no problem. So, uh, so off he went, and um, we eventually, I, I like to say these little tiny red fluorescing cells uh, made their appearance. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of, of this journey. Um, so there they are, Prochlorococcus. Uh, this is their first picture with the red fluorescence. Hi history shows if you go back in the literature, there were already published pictures, electron micrographs. Um, by Johnson and Seaberth, I will give them credit, um, but they didn't realize it was a different organism from other ones. So they, they were actually discovered a couple of times before this. So, um, but this I decided to make my life's work. Um, so, and they are, if you put a hundred of them on a human hair, these guys refuse to cooperate. And I, tried to make them line up and they wouldn't. And then I thought, oh, I'll just leave it because that's sort of like our experiments. Um, <laughs> some of them work and some of them don't. But anyway, 100 prochlorococcus cells. And the next picture shows you why. This is what they look like under a light microscope if you don't use the fluorescence microscope. So you, you see they just look like a bunch, we, we say a bunch of schmutz on, the, on a microscope slide. Um, so that is why nobody recognized them before. You'd put seawater and that's what you would see. Okay, um, so their world, um, here they are. They divide in half roughly once every one or two days. Um, that's how they reproduce. Uh, they get eaten about as fast as they divide in half. Uh, so their cell numbers, and well, they also get infected by viruses. So even though they're growing fast, um, they're also dying fast. Um, so the turnover time is about one to three days. So you have this incredibly dynamic system, but the, the cell numbers stay roughly the same. Um, it's just exquisite. It's, uh, it blows my mind every time I, we have these time series. I'll show some tomorrow. Um, and I think, geez, with all the complexity, and yet there's just this beautiful stability in this system. And it's incredibly dilute out in the open ocean the concentrations of these essential elements that they need are, are very dilute. And we, for some of the trace metals, like iron and cobalt, we, the cells are bumping into these atoms like one at a time to get them. We can't even figure out how that, how that can possibly work. But if you look at the concentrations, um, it's, it's very dilute. And of course, they live with other, they live with other, other bacteria. And these are the giant phytoplankton um, that they deal with. Uh, so 
the areas where they dominate are these open ocean blue water um, gyres uh, where the nutrient levels are extremely low. They're, they're, the prochlorococcus are the champions of sucking the nutrients at the very low level nutrients. And this is where they dominate. And some of these areas, they're half of the photosynthetic um, plankton in these areas. And this is what that water looks like if you're out there. It's just incredibly blue. And when you see green water on the coast and stuff, that's because it's filled with phytoplankton out there. It looks like there's nothing there, but they're there. Um, there's 100 million prochlorococcus per liter, um, three octillion in the global ocean. Um, that's 10 to the 27th, and there are more prochlorococcus than there are grains of sand <laughs> on Earth. Um, then there are stars in the galaxy, or all the galaxies, or something. Anyway, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> and about the same amount as the number of atoms we have in our body. So you can pick, uh, whichever one of those is most impressive, you can, you can pick. Um, so here's what they look like um, under a really good microscope, um, little green balls. And in our cultures, they're this beautiful green photosynthetic. Um, and if you added up all of their weight, uh, they weigh twice as much as the human population. So there, there's tiny little invisible things out there, but there are so many of them that they're incredibly important. Um, and their photosynthesis is equal to all of the annual photosynthesis of the equal is missing there. Uh, I changed that first thing this morning. Um, equal to all the crops on land. So one of the big questions in ecology would be, um, how can a single species, even though we now know it's not really a species, be so dominant on the earth? Uh, because in e any ecological system, one st that, would, that would be an unstable system. And what we learned was that there's extraordinary diversity within, within these, um, this group. There are cells that are high light adapted that live in the surface waters. Uh, there are cells that are low light adapted that live in the deep waters and everything in between. So in terms of light adaptation, they're um, incredibly diverse. And then we learned that in terms of temperature adaptation, they're incredibly diverse. Um, the, the, the cells that live in the warm waters in the equatorial regions are adapted to the high temperatures there and the cells on the um, polar, more toward the poles, are low temperature adapted. Um, so those were two niche dimensions that we first learned through physiological experiments differentiated uh, the different isolates that we got from the cultures. And then we were able to show in the field how they were distributed along these gradients according to their optima in the lab. Um, so in around 19, in 2003, genomics entered the scene. When they finished sequencing the, the, the human genome, there were lots of sequencing machines waiting for something to sequence. And um, the Department of Energy launched this microbial genome project. And we were really lucky to get in on the ground floor because Prochlorococcus was so small, it had such a small genome um, that they could do it rapidly. Um, and the first thing we learned was that the different strains we had had different numbers of genes, which was vastly different numbers of genes. They ranged from 1,700 to 2,700 genes, um, which was the first like eye-opener about the diversity. Uh, and then we learned that if we compared the different strains, they only had 100, a 1,000 a, a genes in common that they shared, that all Prochlorococcus shared. So that was incredibly sobering. And as we sequenced more and more strains, we would keep finding 100 to 200 new genes that we'd never seen before. So the collective genome kept growing and growing. And, and, and you got this feeling that you're dealing with a, a superorganism. And the projected genome of the, we call it the collective or the pro federation of all the um, prochlorococcus on Earth, is projected to be 80,000 genes, which is four times the size of the human genome. And that's a lot of information. To date, we've, we've actually documented 20,000 of those. And my goal before I retire is to 
to get to the 80,000, which me, I have to live to be 100. But anyway, so just to drive home the, the kind of diversity, it's not just, like we, we all have the same number of genes. We just have different variants, which gives us you know, different colored eyes and things. If humans were like Prochlorococcus, it would be more like this. <laughs> Some of us could be, live underwater. Some of us could photosynthesize. We'd be the lucky ones. And, uh, or fly, that would be lucky too. Um, I mean, the analogy, I was sitting in, a, in our lab, my group meeting once, and I said, I really need a better analogy for this whole thing. And one of my students came up with the uh, smartphone. And if the smartphone is the cell and the apps are the genes, um, then this, these are the core genes, the thousand that, that, that all the cells share. These are the genes in your smartphone that you can't, or the, the apps that you can't delete. They're the, they're the thing that make it the phone, make it the prochlorococcus, um, and they're shared by all of us. And then we all custom design our smartphones um, with these niche-defining genes, which just, if, if I collected all of your phones, I could describe your, your lifestyle, your niche, by the, the apps that are on your, on your phones. So um, this is a travel enthusiast. Um, this would be a, somebody interested in finance, and this is somebody obsessed with the weather. Um, <laughs> so you can carry this analogy on and on by getting into the settings, and then there are alleles in there, for those of you that teach population genetics. Um, but anyway, uh, so this is our analogy. So with 80,000, with a gene pool of 80,000 genes, the possibilities for diversity are extraordinary. Um, and this is what we're trying to unravel um, and map the, the diversity of the genomes uh, along the gradients in the oceans. And more importantly, Prochlorococcus tells us what's important to it, to it by showing us its genomes. If we collect you know, one from this area, or one, I'll talk about this tomorrow, but the Atlantic versus the Pacific, they have different genes. So they tell us what their experience is. They're our little reporters. Okay, so this is MIT, um, <laughs> where everything <laughs> has to be useful. Uh, so this is what I get often when I describe my work. Well, that's really interesting, but how can you use them? You know, and I say, but they're out there doing their job every day, keeping the planet. Um, we don't really need to use them, but if you must, um, this is how we justify them. Um, they are the most efficient solar-powered energy converter. Um, we, if we got them down to this core genome, which you eventually we might be able to by doing genetics with them, that's another story, um, knocking out all those extra genes and getting down to the core, um, they, they would be a really lean and mean photosynthesis machine. Um, so what we argue is they could be used as a chassis for synthetic biology to make artificial photosynthesis. In other words, nature has spent millions of years designing this incredible machine. We can be inspired by that design um, and use that to, to develop. And, and, and some people are actually working on this, um, which would be really fun if Prochlorococcus could make that contribution. Okay, so a few things that uh, it has taught us, and a lot of the mysteries that it has generated. I'm just going to talk, briefly talk about these, and then tomorrow I'll give you a little more detail. Uh, the first thing we learned was that um, it been known for a long time that nitrate availability in the ocean is, is one thing that limits the photosynthesis. Uh, and so models of global photosynthesis in the ocean are often driven by this limiting factor, the amount of nitrate. And the first isolates of Prochlorococcus wouldn't grow on nitrate. And when we got their genomes, they didn't have this important enzyme that you need to use nitrate, which was shocking. Uh, so this half the chlorophyll in the middle of the ocean couldn't, could, not, could not use nitrate, so the models had, have to be adjusted to, to that. So that was a, an eye-opener. Um, and now we know a lot more about that and who has them and who doesn't and why they what they might be doing, but it's really interesting. Um, the other thing that's really exciting um, is one of my postdocs, Steve Biller, discovered, uh, th this is a picture of Prochlorococcus with these little bubbles, and every time a new person would come to the lab, I'd show them the picture, and I'd say, what do you think those are? 
And they'd say, I don't know, and they'd go work on another project. <laughs> Steve said, I think those are vesicles, because they've been shown, he came from a classical um, microbiology background and had seen them in other my, more, more, more um, commonly studied microbes. And I said, good, go figure it out. And so he did. And he figured out how to isolate them um, and estimates that there are 10 to the 27th, 10 to the 28th per day produced in the ocean. And this is now a feature of ocean ecosystems that we didn't know existed. Um, and then he was able to harvest these little vesicles from the, from the ocean water. And because they contain DNA, um, you can actually sequence the DNA in them and understand who made them. And he showed that about at least half of the microbial species that we see in the oceans are producing these vesicles. It's a huge mystery of what their function is, and I'll talk tomorrow about We think we, we're on to something. Oh, it's very exciting. Um, but, but I think the, the other moral of the story here is that by studying this organism, it kind of points the way. It tells, us, it tells us where to go next, what to study, and what's important in the ocean. But another thing that was discovered through the genomes was um, they make these novel uh, secondary metabolites that are called lanthipeptides, and they're made by other bacteria, but they usually make one or two. Prochlorococcus and some of its cousins um, make 20 to 80 of these little molecules that got their own name, prochlorocins. I didn't name them. Uh, a chemist that we collaborate with named them these, this. Um, and we don't know what their function is in other, these types of molecules in other microbes uh, are antibiotics. For example, there's one that's used in dairy products to, to be an antibiotic. I think it's called nicin um, in, the in this category of, of molecules. Um, we also have some evidence they might be playing a role in, <coughs> in the metabolic marketplace uh, in, the, in the oceans that other organisms might be using them. Um, there are also signaling compounds in other microorganisms. So I have this image of Prochlorococcus out there talking to its friends. Um, we have no idea. Um, we also have a theory that they might be uh, involved in, in defense from predation, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. There's also a, a something, one of the things we do with Prochlorococcus is we play around and we say, I wonder what would happen if. And so one of the things that happens in the oceans um, is the wind blows, the surface waters mix, and Prochlorococcus and other phytoplankton get mixed down into the deep water. Um, and then they come back up at some point or don't. Um, and so one of the questions we asked was, how long can they survive if we put them in the dark? Um, which would tell us something about their circulation in the oceans and, um, and just, you know, see what happens. And what we learned is that they actually learn that if you put them in the dark repeatedly, they recover faster uh, from the darkness. And it's not a genetic change, um, and it sticks and we have no idea what the mechanism is. Um, and tomorrow I'll show the evidence for that, so you don't think I'm crazy. Um, but it's really exciting because we, it, we think it's epigenetics. It's, some, it's either um, some, something in the regulation or, or something um, that there's a whole field of epigenetics that now this organism is dragging me into. Um, so, but it's, it, it's really striking. Uh, and the other thing that's true of, the, of that group of experiments is they, they don't survive long at all unless they have one of their other ba bacterial friends with them. We put uh, one, another species of, of, of a non-photosynthetic microbe in there. They survive much longer uh, in the dark. So that's a whole other story. Okay. Learning from the past and guessing at the future. Um, this is another story. This is uh, the Earth 600 million years ago, according to this website, where you can plug in any, any era and you can see what the Earth is. Um, and as I was making this slide, I realized that my jet lag would be a lot 
less severe if, if, if I was 600 million years ago, because um, it's the wrong direction, jet lag. But, um, but this is the, what the Earth looked like when Prochlorococcus evolved. Um, there, were, there was, you know, life had been on Earth for, for a long time, microbial life, and there was you know, small amounts of higher organisms. Um, uh, so the question is, you know, what happened between this and this uh, to make the abundant uh, life forms that we have today? And of course, I like to give Prochlorococcus all the credit, but um, that's not really true. Um, so if we look at the whole evolution of the Earth, um, two and a half billion years ago was this big, first big boost, and there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, the early Earth. This is the first big boost of oxygen when photosynthesis evolved, um, the ancient ancestors of, of Prochlorococcus, uh, putting <coughs> oxygen into the atmosphere, and then things were kind of stable for a while. And this little bump was when Prochlorococcus evolved. Um, 600 million years ago. And that's when we had what's called the Cambrian explosion. That's when life really diversified. That's when there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere for larger organisms to, to be able to evolve. And I'm not giving Prochlorococcus credit for this Cambrian explosion, um, uh, but it, by studying the processes that were occurring in the Earth system during that period through the lens of the evolution of Prochlorococcus metabolism, a uh, bright young postdoc in my lab, Roger, Rohir Brockman, um, wrote this paper, Me Metabolic Evolution in the Self-Organization of Ecosystems. So um, it, it's, it's again using Prochlorococcus as a, as a mechanism to look back on what the Earth might have been like as it, Prochlorococcus was evolving, and we can see that through its, its metabolism. And then how about the future? Uh, people always ask me, you know, what's going to happen as the, as the Earth warms? And of course we don't know, um, but one of the, because they're so temperature dependent, um, and they, they, do, they do like warm temperatures, you, you notice they don't live up here and down here. Um, and so there's one paper that has modeled what their densities would, would, how they would change as a function of the warming of the oceans. And we've simulated this. I think somehow it will, whoops. So that movie's not working. Well, anyway, um, there will be a 30% increase in the number of cells uh, according to this model where it only relies on temperature. Let's see if it's not going to work. Um, but that is just one of the variables that influences Prochlorococcus. Um, and there are also studies on CO2 concentration and how that will influence them, um, the changing pH of the ocean and how that will influence them. And all of these things are variable. Um, and the interactions between those variables, we haven't a clue how that will influence them and all the other phytoplankton um, in the oceans. So, if and, and even if they increase, that may be good for Prochlorococcus, but it's not good for all the other phytoplankton that live out there. Um, there'll be winners and losers in this climate change. Uh, and I, I think we really don't understand how those changes are gonna change the ocean, ocean ecosystem. I mean, the one thing we do know um, is that as the oceans warm, as the surface waters warm, they're more and more isolated from the deep waters that I showed you the picture of, uh, and that means they get less renewal of nutrients from the deep waters, and that means the phytoplankton have less fuel to keep going, which means there'll be less photosynthesis, which means that biological pump we'll have less to work with, on and on and on. Um, so it's all of these connections. I mean, it's, it's easy to show one slide that says temperature will make them, you know, more dense, but that's, uh, that's so grossly oversimplified. Um, so that's the point of showing it. It's not to say we know this will happen, it's to say this is only one thing um, that, will, that will likely change. So um, just to wrap up, uh, uh, as, as you, in the kind introduction 
uh, said that this is our goal with Prochlorococcus, is to develop a, a, a new biology. Um, I know that sounds a little bit bold, but um, you got to set, as one of my colleagues says, never make small plans. <laughs> um, so uh, that has been the goal, uh, is, to de is, to, is to argue that it's not possible to understand life on this earth if you don't study it across all the scales of biological organization. And there's been so much emphasis put on, um, the very, on the very small scale to understand the machinery of life that is extremely important and has been incredibly powerful um, in biomedical sciences, et cetera. Uh, but as I was saying earlier, when we study Prochlorococcus by itself versus when we put one other species with it, we get a totally different result in our experiment. So, you know, when I talk to my colleagues in the, in the biology department at MIT you know, you know, who have been studying a single strain of a single microbe for, you know, 50 years, I say, well, you know, why don't you add another one? See what happens. <laughs> um, and um, so we have these really interesting conversations. Uh, but I think that uh, it, it's, this is, I think, the, the new frontier, and I'm so grateful to the Crawford Foundation for recognizing ecology, the significance of ecology, because basically this is what, what, what we're doing. Um, and to be able to study now in ecology from the genome level all the way up to the global level is, is really opening up possibilities for all, all the areas of ecology. We as microbiologists have been so e lucky to be on the ground floor to be able to use genetics. Um, but soon, and already, you know, you can, you'll be able to sequence anything like that and use genetics um, at all the scales of, of organization. So with that, I have so many people to thank, um, but I lumped them. In this talk, I haven't talked about individual people, but I mean, all of my success ha is, is due to the extraordinary students and postdocs and people that I've had in my, in, in my lab over the years. I mean, they've just been incredible. I, I, as I'll say tomorrow, they're like ecotypes, each of them. They work in different dimensions of Prochlorococcus, and the lab is the ecosystem, and they all work together. Um, but focused on this one organism. So I, I've, I've been just incredibly lucky. Um, and then all of the funding agencies that uh, believe in the value of just basic research and don't say, yeah, but what's it good for, you know? Um, and of course, with deep gratitude to the Crawford Foundation and everybody that has gone into um, making this the most exciting three days of my life. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, so now we have some time, about 15 minutes or so, for questions, discussions, comments. Um, there will be some microphones. Yeah, there we have it. Uh, Shastin, yes? Thank you for a most amazing presentation. I think this was the best presentation I've heard ever, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and my head is full of questions, but let's pick one. So how come that this small creature, which is fairly new on the scene, if you compare to cyanobacteria in general, how, how come that it has become so dominant? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, a, well, that's a good question. Uh, there's one other species that I should, or group that I should mention, is Synecococcus, it's also incredibly dominant. And, 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 but, uh, you know, I'm so biased for this organism that, uh, 
Tomorrow I'll sort of fess up that Seneca caucus is <laughs> should get more attention. But anyway, that, but I think the answer is it, it's because they're so small, they're numerically dominating. Um, but in terms of their bio, even though they, there's a lot of biomass, um, the larger cells uh, have a lot of biomass. So, but in terms of the the open ocean, I think their ability to dominate, and this is part of that that wonderful paper that my postdoc wrote, it, it has to do with their ability to draw these nutrients down so low because their surface to volume ratio is so high that they're the ones that can get that last bit of a nutrient because they're not limited by the diffusion rate of the nutrients toward them, whereas the big cells have a problem. And that one of the questions is how do the big cells even make it? They're out there. And I think they're eating Prochlorococcus to get the, they, well, some of them are, we know for sure, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think a lot more of them are than, than we know about. Um, yes, some of them we know about are <laughs> Alex. <it's over. laughs> Alex was in my introductory ecology class back in, when she was an undergraduate at Wellesley. <laughs> 1988. She was in on the ground floor. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and she studies the, 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 the little creatures that, eat everything. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Given the fact that Pulcarococcus can adapt so well to temperature, why aren't they abundant in the Arctic? Ah, oh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, Tom. Um, we have no idea. Uh, because their cousins, the ones that I've neglected to talk enough about, um, do do Sinecococcus can grow in the in the colder waters and temperature adaptation is really hard to study which is, that's another thing I keep telling students and postdocs figure this out and then they look into it a little bit and they say nah I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna get it <laughs> it's it's just difficult to study because so many systems are involved um, but um, but that's a good question we don't know that why Sinecococcus can and Prochlorococcus can't. Um, don't know. I have a question. I can, uh, while you're thinking about something, uh, why didn't you dare to give Prochlorococcus credit for the Cambrian explosion? I'm thinking, <laughs> uh, when looking at that uh, graph, it seems quite convincing. Yeah, I know, but I, I simplified. <laughs> I mean, I I have sort of done that, and Rohir Brockman, who who wrote the paper, said, "Penny, no, you've got, because <laughs> um, it did it did play a role in that little bump of oxygen." But there were lots of other photosynthetic okay. organisms that, yeah, it wasn't the only one around at that time. But the looking at its metabolism and in, in that I give Rohir total credit for that paper I mean it, he he it's his it's his vision and um he sees in these metabolic pathways uh, the, how how the earth system has forced the evolution of prochlorococcus and their ability to continue to suck down the nutrients um and and in doing that I'll give you a little snippet. Um, they in, they would increase their their photosynthetic rate, and put car in order to get the nutrients. But they didn't need the carbon, and they'd put it out into the ocean, which we are arguing complexed the iron, which was not available, and made that available to everybody to boost all of the photosynthesis. Okay. So Prochlorococcus was a helper. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, I think Don was. First, I think, and then we have Kister, and we got some more. Okay, so every time I hear about um, Prochlorococcus, <coughs> I learn something new that totally amazes me. And uh, one thing you mentioned today, if I put on my pharmacologist hat, was that they find these scarce components that they need for their life. How can they do that? You said it's largely unknown, but surely you must have some ideas. Do they have a lot of receptors on the cell surface, surface to find uh, the elements, for instance? And do they have very high affinities for those? We, one would guess. However, nobody is studying them in that, at that level in terms of their transport. They do have you know, transporters and, and surfaces. And one, like for iron, they, 
They have transporters for siderophores. Um, they don't make them, but siderophores are, are molecules that some organisms put out and complex iron and then take it back up. Prochlorococcus apparently takes up things that other people have, other people, boy, I really have, <laughs> that other microbes have made. So, um, but it really has not been studied at, at extensively at all. And, and some of these, the, the calculations that I was making about bumping into atoms, those are all averages, assuming everything is mixed up. And more and more we're learning that there are areas that are where cells are colonized, whether well, it's marine snow, cells are colonized on those. We, we didn't think Prochlorococcus got together in clumps until recently. We're starting to, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, but we've found that they, they have a pathway for um, metabolizing chitin, which is what all the invertebrates make, and um, we think they might be attaching to pieces of invertebrate, you know, little zooplankton shells and dissolving those. So, it's this invisible world that we, you know, we imagine, but we really haven't a clue what, what, how they get through their day. And, and so these numbers are all averages based on X per milliliter. And, and probably there are little villages in there <laughs> that are, are exchanging things. And those, so we don't know. Kister. So. Yeah, great lecture. Thank you. Uh, I uh, side with Justin Johannes on there. <laughs> One of the very best. Uh, I got fascinated by the number of genes, uh, of which they only share 25%. Uh, it makes me think about the genetic structure of, of the organism. And, and uh, you, uh, sorry about my ignorance. I'm a chemical entomologist, uh, how do they reproduce? Is there gene transfer between the different uh, uh. populations? What, uh, yeah, maybe I would have liked to see a um, uh, phylogenetic tree or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, will we see that tomorrow? Really good question. Yes, you will see that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I always steer away from tree, phylogenetic trees in general lectures, but, um, and, and, but that's, that's a very good question, and tomorrow I will reveal a new theory we have about how these genes are moving around. Um, we think those vesicles that I showed you are playing a role in mixing things up. Um, where there's not much, I, I should tell you, we don't have a genetic system for Prochlorococcus. We cannot do genetics with it yet. We've been working on this for 15 years. They just don't want to take up foreign DNA in our hands. I mean, obviously they're doing it out in the, out in the world because you have this extraordinary diversity. Um, but um, but we're, we're, you know, we're, we're working on that, uh, and which will help us really understand a lot more about these, these genes. But, but there, there's obviously a lot of um, genetic information moving around among them in the in the and we know viruses play a role i didn't have time to get into that here but viruses do play a role but we're starting to think these vesicles are playing a, a, a big role and I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow it's hot off the press um just the last month in the lab so i had wondered like you had talked about trace elements more or less cobalt being uh, pretty limited uh, have you looked at uh, population distribution in tectonic boundaries or coastlines um, and compared it all with the um, uh, gyres and uh, the, uh, I know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, have we looked at the distribution of, yeah, of, cause like the of concentration genes involved in, in in metal along gradients? Is that what you Yeah, because the concentrations on the tectonic boundaries would be highest in those metals, and the same thing for yeah. the coastlines. So in theory, there should be more activity in those. I didn't know if you had seen that or not. In fact, in fact, yes, we have. Uh, they don't, Prochlorococcus does not grow uh, very close to the coastlines, um, at least not in the, not in the not on the east coast of the United States where I would like to study it. It's, you have to go all the way out to the Gulf Stream, but other areas it, it, it does. We haven't looked 
the coast, but one thing we've done is compare the Atlantic and the Pacific open ocean. Um, and we have uh, evidence that the Atlantic Ocean has higher iron concentrations than the Pacific because it gets the dust from the, from the desert. And um, the cells there don't have any of these siderophore transporters that for iron, and the cells in the Pacific do. So that's one telltale sign there. But that's the only thing uh, that we've, that we've been, been able to map. Um, but well, the data's available if you'd like to look mm. at it. <laughs> it's all out there. Um, I'm trying to get more uh, people to use yes. it. Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, thank you for this very nice talk. Um, Christer got my question, so uh, <laughs> I will modify it slightly. Um, so you see a lot of uh, uh, different genes in different populations, let's say, of Plochlorococcus. Um, do you think, uh, have you seen, have you evidence that some of these genes are under selection within different regions, for example, in warmer areas versus colder waters and so on? Um, not as a function of temperature, but um, tomorrow I will show some evidence for, uh, for example, phosphorus. Um, again, we compare Atlantic and Pacific a lot because our, our playgrounds are Bermuda and Hawaii uh, <laughs> for studying Prochlorococcus. Um, and we go other places too, but they have time series stations. So, um, and I'll show some evidence tomorrow about the the phosphorus concentrations in the Atlantic are, are really low compared to the Pacific. And you can look at very closely related Prochlorococcus in the two oceans. And the ones in the Atlantic have this little cassette of phosphorus acquisition genes. Um, they, they're just screaming to tell us their story. That's uh, and then, but then you get into something like nitrogen and nitrate, and it gets much more complicated. And we're working on that too. We'll talk about that a little tomorrow. Thank you. Any more question? Yes, please. <laughs> Can you pass the microphone? DNA bearing vesicles that Prochlorococcus takes up have a genetic component. And are those genomes consistent? And, and if so, do they show up in eDNA surveys? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the answer to your first question is that's the mystery that will be revealed tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, yeah, the answer, the, we think, yes, that they're enriched in a particular um, part of the genome that we think is very important. Um, and, but the question about do they show up in, in environmental DNA, you mean when people just collect everything? Right. Um, they would, but you wouldn't know it was in a vesicle. At least you wouldn't have until this new discovery, which maybe you could start to. I mean, the, 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 I don't mean to be obtuse, no, no, no. but it'd be so hard to explain that without giving the buildup. But th we we have discovered features of the Prochlorococcus genome that are pretty regular and that that do show up in in vesicles. If other microbes also have that feature, it could lead. Um, but but I should say that you know the, the doing the bioinformatics on the, the people that study the the the, uh, the genome information um, ha in everything we've done. I mean, I'm so dependent on those people in my lab. I have no clue. I don't even know where the data is. Um, but there, I realized how at one with the data they have to get to really find these fine features and look for general patterns. Um, and it's taken a while, but then some of these things just, just, just popped out, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. It's just that there's a lot of noise in eDNA surveys, and I wonder if, if the vesicles could be a source of some of that noise that we can now learn to filter out. Filter out? <laughs> <laughs> Identify. Uh, yeah, interpret. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the noise. No, you're being full circle here because in the discovery of Prochlorococcus in these, in these flow cytometry signatures, 
we thought it was noise in the beginning because it was so close to the baseline because they're so small that the, it was really close to the baseline. And um, we just ignored it for a while. And then we'd start to play around with the water and put it in high light and low light and whatever. And that, that noise started behaving some way that was systematic. And we said, hmm, maybe it's not noise. Um, so anyway, thank you for that setup. <laughs> 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 okay, we have a, a question over there. Hi, Penny. It's uh, super fun to, to watch your presentations. Um, I have uh, two questions, so uh, m uh, provocative. So one is, uh, if, there were, if there was a mean magician that killed all the Procolococcus in the ocean, <laughs> <laughs> would it bring us back to pre-Cambrian? Uh, or in general, how, how would the ocean change the bio biogeochemistry so, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a big scale? And another question is, thinking of the changes in the ocean now, with the temperature changes, uh, uh, CO2, pH, are there any signs we can see right now in, in the genetics, uh, in, in the distribution of uh, types and, and may, may, maybe evolution of Procolococcus that uh, uh, can give us some insights into the future of uh, that big collective of Procolococcus? <laughs> Ramunas is a collaborator too. He wouldn't. <laughs> um, well, the first question: if they were, if Procolococcus is eliminated, you know, I think, as I said, I think they're playing a role in 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 being a little nutrient snack for the. Uh, they're concentrating nutrients so larger cells can can eat them, um, and so if you get rid of them, the I don't know what would happen <laughs> when the system collapse. Um, I don't know. That would actually be a really interesting experiment to try to, you know, to try to do in a in a bottle. Um, I mean, obviously, they they do t ten percent of the photosynthesis in those ecosystems. So you'd you'd lose that photosynthesis, and you'd lose um, you'd lose the food source for these tiny protists that are really abundant. <laughs> we all think our organism is is the most important and abundant and if you we, we have a joke that if you added up the biomass of all of our favorite organisms <laughs> it would be like <laughs> 500 times what's actually out there. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah so I I, I because Prochlorococcus is part, I showed those arrows where it comes in and goes right out, and Prochlorococcus photosynthesized gets eaten, and then the CO2 goes right back out. So some people like to argue, who cares about them? They're not involved in this marine snow and putting the CO2 down in the deep ocean and all of that. And again, I argue they're an incredible, important, integral part of the machinery that keeps the surface going, the machinery that 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 allows that pump to work. Um, but the only way to know the answer to that question is to do it. Um, and I don't know how to do that yet. And the second question was about about whether there are any signs oh. of. Uh, where, where the Procolococcus Collective is heading with, with the change, change in, in, yeah. in um, pH and temperature. No, a couple of people have studied um, uh, the pH changes or CO2 changes, but it's, you know, it's really, again, it's so difficult to study because um, you have to study them alone and then you have to study them with their heterotrophic friends in there and you get a totally different result. And, of course, that's, if you had the whole community in there, you get you get another result. So it's just, uh, and I, mu I, mu I must say there's, like, oh, there's only about, there's, how many people would you say? There may be 10 labs in the world that are working on this organism um, intensively. So, so there are all these questions that are, uh, you know, just waiting to be worked on. Okay, uh, this is so interesting and so fun, but we also have a time schedule. But I think I can allow one more question over there. The final question for today, if you can pass the microphone. 
So hi. Um, actually, I'm curious to know what how Pleurococcus population react to those iron fertilization experiment, <laughs> and maybe what as a somebody from MIT, how, what do you think about those kind of experiment? Oh boy, that's a that's a great last <laughs> question. Um, yeah. How do they react? We actually I can actually answer that because we were involved in the first scientific iron fertilization experiment out um, in the in the Pacific, the Equatorial Pacific, and which was designed simply to understand the ecosystem. Um, you know, how, how where in areas where iron is limiting, what would happen if you added iron? And we studied what, what Prochlorococcus did was it grew a little faster when you added iron, uh, but it was eaten faster too. <laughs> so uh, so its little little wheel just went around a little faster while <clears throat> the larger cells, the ones I showed in the beginning, would really bloom, just like that exponential growth slide that I showed. Um, because their predator, Prochlorococcus's predators are, are little guys that are just there, and if they grow, the little guys will just eat them. It just goes round and round and round and round. The bigger ones uh, are eaten by much larger zooplankton, um, and they, zooplankton, don't catch up as fast. So you have this bloom of the bigger cells and the zooplankton. In one of the experiments, they actually documented zooplankton swimming into the patch. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, th th this is, these are open ocean fertilization experiments where you actually dump iron into the ocean with the ship and go around and round and make a patch of enriched with iron and then you see what the ecosystem does. And the second half of your question is not what as a result of those experiments, scientific experiments, designed to understand how the oceans work, people started to think, oh, what if we could, how can we use this? What if we could fertilize the oceans, the whole ocean, get the phytoplankton to photosynthesize more, get them to settle, that marine snow, to the deep ocean, get all that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and I've written several papers on why that's a bad idea. Um, and I don't have time to go into the details here, but um, there's no free lunch there. Uh, you totally change the ecosystem in order to get that to work. Um, it probably would eliminate Prochlorococcus in the long run, um, but that's not why I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a very long story, but I think it's, that it's one of the geoengineering proposals is to fertilize the entire ocean um, to stimulate photosynthesis to bury carbon in the deep ocean and there are so many unintended consequences of doing that uh, that we know would happen that um, I, I was moved some years ago to write some papers about that uh, so we can talk about that in more detail but I'm on record saying it's a bad idea <laughs> Okay, then I think it's time to close this uh, lecture. W thank you all for coming. But before we go, I think we should thank the main actor here, Professor Chisholm, for this excellent lecture describing excellent science. So thank you very much. Thank you.